so good morning, everyone, and to those who are joining from the West Coast, like Shailaja and myself, and good evening to those in India, Bangladesh, uh, and elsewhere, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to have you all here for this event that we are, that South Asia Peace Action Network is doing. And as all of you know who've joined, uh, this is the first time we are going on YouTube live. So for that, uh, I think if everybody could, uh, I don't know if somebody could share the YouTube live, live link and people can send it out to people that they know. So we have um, some kind of traction there. It doesn't have to be now, it can be later. So I will now formally welcome everybody to this event titled uh, celebrating love beyond borders and boundaries. My name is Bina Sarwar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan, from South Asia, and I'm currently based in Boston. But right now I am in Los Angeles, where I arrived very late at night after a flight delay due to snowstorms. Uh, I see, I saw the plane being de-iced for the first time um, because I was sitting over the wing. And um, I join you from Los Angeles, where I am right now. I'm off to uh, San Francisco next week for an event on India, Pakistan, the new great game at the Cosmopolitan Club on March the 2nd, uh, Common, Commonwealth Club, I, I keep saying Cosmopolitan Club, at the Commonwealth Club uh, in San Francisco, March the 2nd. And um, I am delighted to uh, welcome all of you to this event. We have uh, some wonderful speakers ahead and um, February, as you know, is the month of love, as we call it, and love comes with challenges everywhere in South Asia, particularly the obstacles can be even more pronounced with uh, barriers of caste, race, gender, religion and ethnicity. Uh, we saw the recent case of 19 year old Ikra Jivani from Pakistan, who uh, fell in love, a uh, real cross border love story, went to Nepal. Uh, to meet her uh, boyfriend who was from India. They got married, uh, went to India illegally. Uh, well, for her, it was illegally. She, they lived there. They were happy. But then they got reported to the police and she was. they were both put in prison. She is back in Pakistan now with her family. He is still in prison for helping uh, a Pakistani enter uh, India illegally. And yes, uh, that was an illegal border crossing. But I mean... This is, we should not be punishing love like this. People, there should be, why should there be these kind of laws and rules that um, that criminalize border crossing? If border crossing was not criminalized, they wouldn't need to be in jail. She wouldn't need to be deported. Why can't we be like the European Union? So this is the sort of um, vision behind this event. And we are really thrilled to uh, explore the experience of love in the region, to introspect on the barriers built against it, and to be inspired by those who persist in following their hearts. I'll just quote from um, uh, the event note where which uh, Ekta found this beautiful quote from Rumi. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. So in the end, you know, it is uh, up to us and how we uh, move forward and um, be, how we are the change and all of that. Um, as always, we will start with a, a reading of um, the charter, of the founding charter. And I am absolutely delighted to uh, invite uh, my dear friend, Shailaja Rao, who is in Seattle, Washington, uh, to read it out. Uh, Shailaja sits on the board of the SVIR, uh, the South Asia Film Festival, for which I am honored to have participated in its very first uh, iteration, I think, back in 2001 or two or three or something like that. I don't remember. It was very long ago. Um, Shailaja also wrote a wonderful piece for uh, Sapan News Network, which is a syndicated service that has emerged out of South Asia piece, uh, Sapan. Um, Sapan News Network, uh, and her piece is about uh, the historic anti-caste discrimination law in Seattle, which is so relevant to the topic that we are discussing today, because a lot of the barriers to love, as we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as we all know, come from uh, uh, caste differences. So Shailaja wrote this piece about, uh, because she was there, she had a front row seat in Seattle when they passed this uh, law, this historic law, and she has written a brilliant piece about it, which is on the uh, SouthAsiaPeace.com website um, for those who would like to know. So Shailaja, um, uh, if without, and, and also Shailaja sits on the board of Dhanak, which is Dhanak for Humanity, which is an organization in India, uh, uh, based in Delhi, but pan um, India, which uh, helps inter-caste or inter-religion couples 
who have got married or who want to get married, uh, whose families oppose their union. So to provide them some support. Um, we also had a Twitter space uh, on February 12th. And if you go to the South Asia Peace um, handle at Twitter on Twitter, you will see it, the recording of that, which was a really wonderful recording uh, put, uh, hosted by Saifullah Saifi in, in Holland. So Shailaja, can I ask you to read the founding charter, please? And um, yes. Who's, uh, I'm going to do it, yes. Uh, floor is yours, Shalaja. You can say a few words and read the founding charter. Okay. So thank you, Bina, and greetings to everyone. I'm delighted to be here and amongst um, uh, such great representation from uh, our South Asian countries. Uh, I will go ahead and are you sharing the screen, Bina, or should I just read off my notes? Can read out from your notes, but I'll share the screen as well. Okay, <clears throat> so I will do the founding charter. Um, SAPAN is a coalition of individuals and representatives of various organizations joining hands for a minimum common agenda, reclaiming South Asia. In doing so, we reiterate our commitment to take forward the principles and ideals of peace, justice, democracy, and human rights articulated by visionaries like Dr. Mubashir Hassan, Nikhil Chakravarti, Asma Jahangir, Nirmala Deshpande, Kuldeep Nair, Rajani Kothari. Among others, a visa-free South Asia or confederation of nations with soft borders. A region in which each nation ensures quality education, justice and freedom of expression and religion to its own citizens, as well as support and solidarity to those of, other, of the other nations. We aim to reclaim South Asia to quote another of our mentors and visionaries, the late I.A. Rahman. We support the objectives of SARC, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. To promote the welfare of the peoples of South Asia and to improve their quality of life, to, ac to accelerate economic growth, social progress and cultural development in the region and to provide all individuals the opportunity to live in dignity and to realize their full potential, to promote and strengthen collective self-reliance among the countries of South Asia, to contribute to mutual trust, understanding and appreciation of one another's problems, to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance in the economic, social, cultural, technical and scientific fields, to strengthen cooperation with other developing countries, to strengthen cooperation among themselves in the international forums on matters of common interest, and to cooperate with international and regional organizations with similar aims and purposes. The South Asia Peace Action Network therefore calls on the governments and peoples of South Asian nations to work towards instituting soft borders and visa-free South Asia or visa on travel to allow freedom of trade and travel to each other's citizens. Ensure human rights and dignity for all their citizens, including religious and ethnic minorities, women, children, and other oppressed communities. Finally, to cooperate in all areas, particularly related to public health, culture, and legal reform, education, environment, climate change, water issues, disarmament, demilitarization and denuclearization. Over to you, Fazia. Um, before before we um, before 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 we go over to Fazia, I would like like to uh, thank thank you, Shailaja, for reading it so well. And I would like to invite people to go who have not signed it to go to southasiapeace.com slash founding dash charter and to endorse the link that's there in several languages. Share it with your contacts. Uh, you can also see a list of the founding organi of the endorsing organizations and um, the founder members uh, who uh, started this uh, South Asia piece uh, after a brainstorming meeting back in March 2021 and uh, subsequent endorsements. Um, and there are some wonderful, really weighty names among them. And we would love people who have not endorsed it to um, join that, uh, to join us there and get on our mailing list. Um, I would like to thank um, 
Vishal for having Vishal Shim, uh, Sharma and uh, Shimla for having prepared the in memoriam that we always start with, and um, and uh, Vishal is a, a recently graduated lawyer and he's one of the pillars of of Sapan as well as are all of our all of you who uh, work with us uh, voluntarily. Um, for which we are so grateful. Fawzia Diba, I'm delighted to um, uh, introduce Dr. Fawzia Diba, my old friend from the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. Uh, Fawzia is from Quetta and um, now lives in New Jersey. And she has uh, wears a lot of hats, uh, including for women's rights and human rights and uh, does a lot for, uh, and is a one of our, another uh, wonderful member of SAPAN. So Fawzia, would you read out the in memoriam and who's going to be running it? Uh, who's going to be running it? Uh, Ekta, you were running it or? Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Over to you, Fawzia. You're muted, my dear. Yeah. Thank you, Veena. Thank you, everybody, to uh, assemble together today for this event. And uh, as we always begin our event, uh, by remembering our, uh, some people. And this is the most somber part of uh, Sapan's monthly event. As we start our events by remembering those South Asian figures who made their mark in life and who left us forever since our last meeting. Before naming those individuals, uh, let us keep in our thoughts the thousands of earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria, as well as those dying and suffering in the Ukraine war. I think I thank Supper Member Fishal for preparing this presentation. Uh, he's good with these uh, uh, techno things that I'm not good with, so I'll be reading them out for you. Uh, we now pay homage to the intellectuals and reformers who were beacons of social justice in South Asia, who Supper members feel proud to call our torchbearers, but who are no more with us. They are Dr. Mubashir Hassan, Dr. Ayer Rahman, Kuldeep Nayar, Nirmala Desh Pandey. Sabine Mahmood, Kamla Bahasin, Sufia Kamal, Dr. Saman uh, Kaligama, Asma Jahangir, Sanya Hussain, Dr. Iqbal Ahmad, Rubina Saigal, Praful Bidwai, Rajni Kolahutri, and Man Madanjit Singh. Uh, next slide, please. So here we are uh, celebrating the life of uh, K. Viswanath, a film director and actor who was regarded as, uh, sorry, sorry for just a second, I will have to, uh, I'm so sorry. So for some technical issue. Um, so yeah, my technical issue is solved. Film director and actor who was regarded as one of the greatest auteurs of Telugu cinema. He was conferred with the uh, Dada Saheb Palki Award, the highest award in cinema of India in 2017. He passed away on 2nd February 23 in Hyderabad, age 92. Vani Jairam, playback singer who sang for over 1,000 Indian movies, recording over 10,000 songs. She was conferred with the Padma Bhushan by the Indian government in 2023. She passed away on 4th of February, 23, in Chennai, age 77. General Parvez Musharraf, Delhi-born Pakistan's chief of army staff, who conducted a military coup and became the country's 10th president, initiated the Kargil War as well as Kashmir Peace Initiative. He passed away on 5th February, 23, in Dubai, age 79. Next, please. Muslimuddin Ahmad, politician and social worker, a Bangladesh Jatiya Sansad member representing the Chittagong 8 constituency. He died on 6th February 23 in Dhaka. He was 74 years old. Karma Ghali, a politician who was a member of the House of Representatives of the Federal Parliament of Nepal. He passed away on 7th February 23 in Kathmandu, age only 59. Amjad Islam Amjad, a famous Urdu poet, screenwriter, playwright, and lyricist in Pakistan. He was author of more than 70 books. He received many awards for his books and his works, including the Pride of Performance, Sitara Imtiaz, Tamra Imtiaz. He passed away on 10th February 23 in Lahore at age 78. Zia Mohyuddin, a very famous acclaimed actor and orator 
known for his recitations from Urdu and English literature and poetry. He played memorable roles in acclaimed films, hosted these iconic Zia Mohyuddin show uh, on Pakistan television from 69 to 73. Uh, he, uh, he also uh, worked in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, if you've seen that movie. Passed away on 13 February 23 in Karachi at the age of 91. Lalita Lajmi, eminent painter born in Kolkata, over a career spanning five decades, she had several exhibitions at both national and international platforms. She passed away on 13 February 23 in Mumbai at the age of 90. And Reza Ali, a social worker and politician who was member of the Jatya Sangsad, representing the uh, Maimon Singh Seven constituency from 2009 to 2014, known for his contributions towards the popular Dhaka University students' movements, a movement in the early 1960s. He passed away on 13 February 23 in Singapore at age 82. SNM Ubaidullah, politician and social worker. He was conferred with the uh, Pera Rigna Anna Award, Pera Rigna Anna Award in 2022 by the Tamil Nadu government for his contributions to the Tamil language and social development. He passed away on 19 February 23 in Tanjava at age 81. Najmul Huda, widely beloved barrister and politician, a former cabinet member of Bangladesh and a four time Jatya Sangsad member representing the Dhaka One constituency, he founded the uh, Trinamul Bangladesh Nationalist Party in 2015, passed away on 19th February 23 in Dhaka at the age of 80. And Anwar Abbas, Mumbai born writer, cultural commentator, educator, migrated to Karachi in 1986. He was a grandson of the poet Hali, nephew of the writer K. A. Abbas, longtime administrator of Habib Public Boys School, Karachi, and indefatigable activist for indo pak peace, and he passed away on 19 February 23 in Karachi at the age of 78. Habib Public School, by the way, is the school where my, my brother also went. So double homage to Anwar Abbas from my side. Um, any, uh, yeah, and we also lost uh, Kanek Reli, a dancer and choreographer, best known as an exponent of Mohinya, Mohinya Tam dance form. Imagine a form that I can't even pronounce. She was a master at that. In 2013, she was conferred with the Padma Bhushan by the government of India. She passed away on 22nd February 23 in Mumbai at the age of 85. So many people left us this month of February and I really thank you for the contributions whoever contributed for all these information. And again, Vishal, thank you for preparing the presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Fozia. And um, there is a question in the group about why General Parvez Musharraf is introduced in there, mm -hmm. is, is clear, is uh, in, included in our um, presentation. Uh, I think it's because despite what he did for, what despite his military, dictatorship and the being um, heading the coup and the Kargil war and everything, he did try for peace. Um, and uh, so I think, and there are a lot of people who remember him for that, for bringing us so close to peace in Kashmir particularly. Um, but anyway, the, that's a controversial thing. We don't need to get into that so much. Um, I'm going to now hand over uh, the, uh, I, just, I just want to also mention that um, uh, Nazmul Huda is a personal loss for our founding member Khushi Kabir. He was she was um, he was her brother-in-law, and uh, her sister um, Sigma is a graduate of uh, Peshawar Law uh, College. is one of the first is the first woman graduate from Peshawar Law College. Anwar Abbas, of course, as Fazia mentioned, the grandson of um, uh, Hali and the uh, uh, nephew of the K. Abbas, also our founding member, Sayyid Hamid's cousin. And uh, and I wrote a obituary on Zia Moedin, which is also on the uh, SouthAsiaPeace.com website um, and has been published in several places um, as our syndicate part of our syndicated service. Um, so Ekta is uh, Ekta Kapoor in Delhi, uh, who's uh, another founding member of Sapan and one of the pillars of Sapan. She's behind the beautiful website uh, and all our web, uh, efforts, as you 
no are all voluntary, as mentioned before. There is a donate link on the website for those who feel moved to contribute. Um, and we would be grateful for that, um, anybody who does that. And I want to just, before I hand it over to uh, Ekta, um, is I want to just uh, also remember Sabine, who was mentioned in the In Memoriam, Sabine Mahmood, uh, who also, I think, really symbolized love. And um, when the the she subverted the, you know, behind the trucks, we have this these sayings, uh, keep your distance, let, lest there be love, you know, fast la rakhe pyar na hone de. In the back of our trucks, a lot of times there's this uh, slogan. And she subverted that and made another slogan, which said, fast la na rakhe pyar hone de. Don't keep a distance, let there be love. And uh, so uh, remembering Sabine also as we uh, go, move on with this. So um, Ekta, I'm going to hand it over to you to uh, conduct the discussion and to um, introduce the panelists and um, we request all panelists to please put on their videos. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. I'm uh, really happy and excited to be the moderator for today's panel. We're of course taking on a subject like love that should be a personal sort of a thing, but it seems to have a lot of traditional social, economic and political ramifications. So at the simplest level of the human body and mind, Love is biology, chemistry, maybe spirituality, but at the actual lived experiences of love in the world, they're never so simple, right? It comes with complications, it comes with obstacles everywhere, and more so in South Asia, because here culturally we have been putting the community over individual happiness. And the cost of this is that in the process of suppressing individual happiness over centuries, we have encouraged the agents of hate, discrimination, and violence. So for generations, we've been hearing these stories of interfaith, intercommunity, cross-border couples, you know, getting married. We have examples of celebrity couples, cricket stars, artists, musicians, writers, and even common people all around us. I'm also an example, by the way. I'm a Punjabi married to a Malayali. And yet, despite modernization, despite globalization, technology, internet, these intercommunity stories continue to be the exceptions and not the rule. So for instance, when I tell people, my husband's from Kerala, you know, they look at me with the stars in their eyes and they're like, oh, you had a love marriage, you know? So even so many years after our countries have become independent, our societies and our governments in South Asia continue to be pyar ke dushman, enemies of love in every way possible. Today, I'm talking to an amazing panel about all these different challenges uh, to love in South Asia. And we're also gonna be inspired by those who have persisted despite odds. I'd like to introduce the panel in alphabetical order. First, we have Asif Iqbal, who is a human rights and child rights activist from India. He is co-founder of the All India Nonprofit Dhanak of Humanity, which has been working on the issues of right to choose in marriage and relationships since 2005. They also take up cases related to forced marriage and honor-based crime. Dhanak of Humanity has won many accolades and was awarded the inaugural Swami Agnivesh Memorial Award 2021 by the US nonprofit Hindus for Human Rights. Next, I welcome Jagmati Sangwan, the National Vice President of All India Democratic Women's Association, EDWA. She's a Beam Awardee volleyball player and has represented India at international tournaments. She's a social activist who has worked several years in the fields of women's empowerment, food security, gender violence, and especially honor-related crimes by traditional caste panchayats in Haryana. She was an active participant in the year-long Indian farmers' protests in various capacities. The next panelist is Namrata Sharma, who has over 30 years of work experience in journalism and women's rights. She is the former president of Center for Investigative Journalism in Nepal and is the editor of Nariswar, Women's Voice, a quarterly magazine in Nepal. Namrata is a member at SAPAN and is part of our volunteer working committee. I'm also happy to welcome Melinda Senevotne, uh, the former editor-in-chief of The Nation newspaper in Sri Lanka. He's an award-winning poet, critic, journalist, translator, political commentator, and activist. He's a contributor to The Daily Mirror and The Daily News, and is one of the most widely read writers in English in Sri Lanka. I'm also delighted to introduce Rubab Mehdi, former regional commissioner, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan. She's a British Pakistani corporate lawyer, interfaith leader, and a human rights campaigner. She was the chief European coordinator and spokesperson for the Ministry of Human Rights Pakistan and helped formulate several federal laws. She's joining us from Peshawar. 
And finally, we have Vincent Raj Aroke Sami, also called Kader. He's been fighting caste discrimination for over 27 years in Tamil Nadu with rights-based interventions. In 2005, he founded the NGO Evidence to not only fight caste discrimination, but to also support couples who face violence for inter-caste relationships. He was recently awarded the Council of Europe's Raoul Wallenberg Prize for bringing meaningful change to the lives of the Dalits. I'll start with Asif, actually. Um, Mr. Asif, you've been working on interfaith and intercommunity marriages in India and protecting couples who face violence. And uh, you yourself had an interfaith uh, marriage, I believe. So how is the situation today for interfaith couples who register under the Special Marriage Act? And I'd like you to especially focus on that one month notice period that couples have to, uh, you know, uh, register, uh, apply for when they register under this act. So how do, how has that affected interfaith couples? And can you also share your experience? Yeah, um, thank you, Ekta. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. And thank you to all of you to making, uh, you know, allowing me to speak and share my views with the people all across South Asia. This is a great opportunity. Um, if coming to the question of love and use of Special Marriage Act, we uh, fortunately have a civil law which takes care of the marriage between people of any faith, any caste, same faith, same caste. So unfortunately, it has been reduced to for interfaith couples in India. And I would also like to tell, and I, maybe a lot of people are aware that the same law, Special Marriage Act, it's an 1872 act. And it is applicable in Bangladesh and Pakistan as well. So uh, we keep getting queries from Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, but the only uh, limitation there is that there is no amendment because uh, there is a provision of renouncing the faith for marrying under the Special Marriage Act in Pakistan and Bangladesh. In India, they have got over this. And in 1954, they have amended that. So coming back to the, uh, the point, the question, uh, we are very clearly, uh, as an organization, have an uh, objective which is saying that there should not be any conversion for the sake of marriage. There should not be change of any name for the sake of marriage. Uh, although it's a constitutional right, adoption or taking a religion, embracing a religion is a constitutional right. But unfortunately, in the case of marriage, it is most of the time or majority of time, it is the girl who changes the name because of the patriarchal mindset. So that's why we are dead against it. And we say that, you know, uh, one should stick to the faith and religion. But but this is very clear that Special Marriage Act, mm -hmm. although it is there, but it has a lot of challenges. There is a 30 days notice period for which the, the notice will be displayed at the conspicuous place at the office of marriage officers. It is not only displayed in the state of Maharashtra, in the state of Telangana, in so many other states, they send it to their to their respective houses. They send it to the police for the verification. They put it on the web portal so that anybody can access it from anywhere. And those people who 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 are we, you know, those who are very very concerned about girl going from our community, their community, they take special initiative. They go and inform the family of the girl that this is what is happening, and you should take care of that. So that is the biggest challenge. And then the 30 days notice period, uh, for that, you have to be a jurisdiction from where you have applied. So for, uh, you know, one has to be staying there for last one month and you need an identity uh, proof of residence. So anybody who's leaving the state, now there are so many states who have come up in India, they have come up with this law, a state law of, you know, of, uh, you know, which they are calling love jihad law and all those things. So those couples who want to solemnize their marriage, they leave their state, they move to a different state, which is slightly easier where they are, they are not strict laws against it. Uh, they have to wait for three to four months for solemnization of the marriage. So that further increases the you know, challenge for the couple. They stay, where are they going to stay? Because finding a rented accommodation is a challenge. They are uh, coming together, different faith is a challenge. Police is after them, their families is after them. So it's a big, big challenge. And if I come to my personal experience, uh, this was the reason which we have started this organization uh, in 2005. 
and uh, that was that when we me and my wife approached the marriage officer in noida which is in up that time also the marriage officer categorically stated that you know i will not sign i will not be the marriage officer because it might lead to law and order problem so and if and, and he added to that he said that and if you are doing it in a different state a different place i will be one of the signatories so <laughs> so that you can very well understand how difficult and how challenging it is even the marriage officer a government class one gazetted officer is saying that i can't do it so these are the challenges of special marriage act yeah so like really like i said pyar ke dushman and all that yeah so <laughs> they don't want people to get married across them it's it's systemic systemic uh, obstacles yeah So I, exactly. think, uh, I just want to sorry, just want to button yeah. very quickly to say that uh, uh, Swara Bhaskar, who re, the Indian actor who yeah. just got married, she also mentioned and, it. Yeah, and and the reason why they they took a month to announce their marriage uh, publicly uh, was because of this. They had to this, go to Mumbai. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. That she she had mentioned this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Arthur, for bringing in this uh, aspect uh, of how the law is creating a barrier to to love. and i think now rubab is back in the room so i'll go back to rubab's question uh, rubab you had uh, uh, are you there now yeah yes yeah, yes i, had, yes, I yeah, am yeah, yeah you had talked about the right to love being linked to the right to equality so can you please elaborate on that i think yes, you are um, yeah. it's a um well love is about equality because um it's about the free the freedom to choose who you want to be with and if um and um, you know um i think that is the freedom this uh, freedom to choose and the freedom to think for yourself that very often scares people from acknowledging uh, love um because once love gets normalized equality gets normalized because love um, as you know it's uh, it speaks a universal language language it tends to go beyond the boundaries of race um um religion so um and if the person has the freedom to choose beyond uh, on the basis of compatibility if they are empowered enough to choose um uh the um so that is why equality um i i mean i think that love is all about equality yeah and you also talked about how some communities can't even dare to dare to love <laughs> would you like to share, talk about that yes because uh, see there is a difference of mindset in how people um see things in the cities and then uh, in the rural areas hmm uh, so uh, you know there the i think uh, rubab your internet connection seems to be coming and going my internet in the cities and there's a mindset okay i think we if the rubab had sent yeah. her presentation she had sent this a brief uh, slide show and we can uh, play that did she send you the updated one or do i no. only have it oh okay no. so i have it so i can you can play it yeah yeah let me i have downloaded first i think so let okay. me just do that you yeah. can uh, get i'll i'll move on yeah 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 okay so uh yeah let's go over and see what the situation in sri lanka is uh, so mr melinda can you tell us about uh, interfaith marriages in sri lanka say between buddhists and hindus or muslims and what are the challenges that you face there when people cross community borders for love uh, well uh, sri lanka is predominantly buddhist so buddhism is essentially a very liberal kind of uh, faith if you want to use that word uh, there are cross religion uh, marriages cross faith marriages love affairs and and things like that there are muslims uh, who have seen her names uh, and uh, of course certain communities like muslims and catholics 
uh, they would like you to, they would want you to convert upon marriage. So that can cause some, some tensions. Usually it's a question of the human race has always been worried about difference. So they, they, uh, difference causes anxiety. So they turn things that they don't understand into gods or devils. And, you know, they either worship them and become dependent or they uh, fear them and try to uh, you know, hide or, or fight. Uh, so that, that is a common thing, I think, across not just South Asia. But in, in Sri Lanka, we don't have the, the kinds of laws that were mentioned earlier. You know, name changes and things. So it's up to up to whoever. And all you got to do is if you're changing your name, you have to put a notice in some newspaper or something like that. Uh, I was married twice and uh, both my wives retained their names. My sister took on her husband's name and I asked her why. And she said, well, either have to take my father's name or my husband's name. Both are the, name, the names of men. And this man is the one I'm planning to spend the rest of my life with. So what the hell? So the, the legal situation is, of course, far more, it's easier. But laws are just, just one element of a whole uh, you know, corpus of things that people need to consider. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is the, and it's not just about religion, it's about caste, it's about community, whether they are Sinhal or Tamil, uh, Sinhal or Muslim, Muslim and Tamil. Uh, and, uh, you know, how, do, how did an island that never had Christianity have a certain percentage of Christians now? Uh, there were uh, there were conversions that were forced upon people, there were people embraced faith and things like that. So that kind of thing is... Uh, I mean, it causes some uh, tensions among communities, mostly with the family. It doesn't get into the community level. It's a, it's a household, household issue that, uh, or a clan, clan thing, uh, you know, my family will this one, me, because I married someone. That could happen in certain cases, but the attitudes towards love uh, are generally f a very, very easy and, and liberal. You know, I, I, I since rural urban was talked about, I grew up in Colombo, which is a city. Mm -hmm. And when I went to university, I had never touched a girl's hand. And my friends from very rural areas laughed at me. And they said, you know, we went to school and came back through the jungle and we played hide and seek, which was kind of a code word for sexual experimentation. In our villages, everyone knows who's sleeping with whom, when, where, and how. Uh, if they get caught, then there's some problem. But after two, three weeks, it goes back to the same thing. So some of the issues are with perceptions about what rural is, what and, and the idyllic uh, village, and you know how all these things. So uh, it's very different, I think, in from country to country. It could be different within the countries. Also, things could be different depending on what part of the country, what kind of community, what kind of uh, religious community you belong to, and the family more than more than anything else, you know. Uh, people will just disown their sisters or brothers. That doesn't mean communities will necessarily disown you. So things are relatively better, I would say, in Sri Lanka right now. And let's hope uh, it stays that way. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. I'll come back to you with another question later. Uh, let's uh, move to Nepal now and get the view from Namrata. Um, uh, Namrata, what is the situation in Nepal at present when it comes to Intercaste, intercommunity love, and are we having more happy endings now compared with the past? Um, well, I wouldn't say we are having. Hello, everybody. First of all, I'm uh, Namrata Sharma from Nepal, um, as I was introduced before. But at the moment, I'm actually speaking from India, uh, and uh, uh, because I'm visiting here uh, with my family for a few days. Um, I wouldn't say there are more happy endings. However, there, there is a there, there's a two angles to this question, Ekta, actually. Um, first of all, I want to start with one very positive and very sweet uh, love story of Nepal, which hasn't been written. But, uh, you know, it, as you all know, before 1990, Nepal was the only Hindu state in the world, as it's known. Um, so intercaste marriage and that too, with inter-religion, inter-faith marriages, uh, very less and unheard of, okay? And so now, that, uh, and that I haven't heard many, there, there could be other inter-faith marriages between Hindus and Buddhists, Hindus being predominant and Buddhists, 
minority of Christianity and uh, Muslim below 4%. But marriages between Hindu and Muslim community is very, very rare, even now. But I know two women of high Brahmin caste, you know, Brahmin caste, but also very predominant Kathmanduites, very well known and all. Two women uh, from my family itself, my relatives past distance, married to Muslim. And both of them I have seen are the happiest women I see, married women in, uh, in Kathmandu. But when they got married, they were totally outcast, barred from entering homes of their uh, parents, both mother's side and father's side, not invited in any events, you know. But slowly as the, uh, but they decide, they decide, they fell in love, they decided to get married, and they decided to adopt the Muslim culture as the uh, culture is once you get married over there. But as the time passed by, you know, the older woman that I talked to you about, her husband passed away, but she's still happily in the Muslim community. But slowly the doors are opening for her. The younger one struggled a lot because her husband then went to work in Dubai and got injured and was fatally injured. But still the family was not accepting them, you know. But you see, as the time goes by, what happened is one of her aunt who was very well off and her children living abroad, liked this first cousin of theirs who had married to a Muslim. And because the elderly couple needed uh, care, you know, the care economy is such that now the children are out who takes care of the thing? And the first cousin was there who needed support financially and a self uh, and a refuge kind of a thing. So uh, uh, apartment in the bungalow was given to her, you see. Now she takes care of the her aunt and the uncle as her cousins are out, but she's still not let in inside the house because in Hindu communities, you know, like if Muslims, start, especially uh, the aunt is so so much uh, staunch uh, Hindu that she will not eat uh, anything touched by a Muslim. So that ostracization is there. But what she has managed to do is she has managed to create a space in the community. And slowly now she's being accepted and she's living there in the Hindu, Hindu community with a husband who is very much welcome. And most of the families actually have started inviting them and their ch child inside their home, you know, so they're very happy. But uh, what I want to say here, Ekta, I just want to show the social, cultural and um, traditional uh, uh, shift in Nepal, you know. As you know, in Nepal, when the communist movement were dying all over the world, the red flag was started coming very strongly from uh, late 80s uh, in the restoration of democracy in 1990 and establishment of Nepal as a republic country now, right? So what had happened is during this period, the left movement became very strong. And in the left movement, within the uh, United Marxist-Leninist uh, UML party and the Maoist party, what happened is a culture within the party was there that they have intercaste marriages. How much love was there and how much convenience was there is a question mark. But they call it a love marriage. For some, it has worked very well. But the stories are that the women struggled a lot, even in the left Maoist movement also, you know, left movement overall. And even within the Maoist cadres, you know, suffered a lot, the children suffered a lot. But what I want, but in the elite Nepali family now, you know, even in Brahmin cultures, marriages between different religion, different class, caste, and structures are acceptable. But over there, education, economy, wealth is high. So acceptability is also high, you see. And, uh, you know, as education, economy predominates the power structure, where the power structure is strong, Love marriages, intercaste marriages are very much accepted. Now I'm going to tell you a story, a very sad story. You know, during the COVID period, when the 
Black Life Matters movement was going in the West and all over the world in Nepal. And I actually, I linked about these two incidents and I wrote also a Dalit boy and a Chetri family girl uh, got uh, fell in love by a net. You know, this is what the children, the, the youth of today do. They fell in love via Facebook, uh, Viber, Twitter, and all that. So the Dalit boy and his uh, family and his friends, actually, four or five friends crossed over from, this is in a very far western region of Nepal, uh, which is one of the most remote parts of uh, Nepal. And so the Dalit boy with his friends came to get his sweetheart, but the rumor was leaked. And the parents of the family heard about it, you see. So before he reached the spot, he was killed. And this was a big event. And we are still trying to get justice for the boy and his friends and the girl, girl also, you see. So, um, you see, it's, it, there's a interesting, uh, there's an interesting um, um, movement in Nepal uh, going on, which has brought by the communists, sometimes I even call it the so-called left movement, there is change in social, uh, religious, cultural structures. But at the same time, what happens is uh, how much it is accepted and who accepts is the question. I said it was interesting that you brought up uh, the communist uh, element there because we have a speaker who is uh, a, a part of the India's, of India's CPM and uh, that's uh, Jagmati Sangwan. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Jagmati if, um, if your camera is on. So my question to you is that, uh, of course, you have worked so much for uh, women's rights, violence against women. You've worked, uh, you know, for uh, against these car panchayats and honor-based crime. Uh, uh, one of the things that you have been a pioneer has been to set up safe houses for couples in Haryana, which has now become a template that is being used across India. So uh, please tell us about this. How did you go about it? And why did we have a need for this kind of a thing in India? Uh, yes, Ikta. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for making me part of this uh, discussion. I'm also learning a lot from the experiences of different uh, countries uh, uh, from our friends. And uh, uh, while uh, talking about our own experience, uh, you know, I'm based in Rotak in Haryana, yes. uh, north of uh, India. And uh, I come from a place of Hali, uh, uh, whom you mentioned earlier also. Uh, and uh, here uh, we have been working around the honor killing and honor crime since uh, more than 30 years. And uh, majorly our intervention has been concentrated around the uh, intercaste uh, choice marriages. Uh, and uh, uh, we have been counseling uh, young couples. We have been getting them married. We are parents of so many of them to uh, get married. And uh, we have been able to get punished uh, uh, many uh, perpetrators of violence here. Uh, and uh, uh, personally, uh, coming from left-oriented organization, uh, most of us, we have got uh, married according to our uh, choice uh, and uh, we also faced uh, some type of uh, hostility and uh, ostracity also at some levels. And uh, then we decided to uh, work on this area uh, and uh, what we find that uh, here uh, people uh, take honor crime and honor killing uh, simply it's a difference of ideas of generational gap and like that. The political economy uh, linked uh, to this choice marriage and this uh, honor killing and honor crime uh, is uh, less in uh, discussion. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, concentrate on uh, that uh, dimension of this uh, choice, marriage, uh, like that. And uh, in Haryana, because uh, 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 there were so many uh, killings and uh, ostracization of, of those people who got married according to their choice, and the state machinery and the human rights protection agencies, uh, they were not coming forward to protect those couples who got married according to their choice. And uh, 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 in that case, we intervened and to fix up the accountability of state, 
uh, towards uh, the uh, uh, the uh, human rights of those uh, individuals who want to get married according to their choice and uh, they were evading it uh, comfortably uh, we uh, uh, evolved this idea of safe uh, couple uh, protection homes uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it was majorly focused that the state can't evade uh, its responsibility towards those young people who are getting married and they are being killed, uh, 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 being no fault of their. Uh, so uh, we evolved this idea and uh, we met the uh, Punjab and Haryana High Court Chief Justice that uh, there should be couple protection homes at all districts. And uh, if a couple perceives uh, some type of uh, violence when they decide to get married, they should be shifted to the protection homes and uh, there uh, all type of facilities uh, must be there for, uh, for them. And uh, the parents uh, who uh, uh, are uh, raised uh, due to the decision of their uh, uh, children, uh, they should be, uh, there should be counseling uh, provision for them also. Uh, so uh, in Haryana, uh, Haryana is the first state uh, and the only state I feel these days, uh, uh, no, uh, in Punjab also, uh, the Punjab Haryana High Court is one and uh, they uh, issued this direction. We have a couple protection homes at all district level. Uh, although the facilities over there are not that good, and uh, in the name of protection, uh, many times there is a violation of their human rights uh, also, uh, uh, whom they will meet, whom they would not, and these type of things. And privacy is the main uh, uh, tragedy there. Uh, but still, uh, they, uh, their lives are saved at least. And uh, some of the parents, uh, while they are undergoing the counseling, they also uh, uh, um, uh, change their mind uh, 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 regarding the violence against their children. Uh, so uh, these days at every district headquarter, there are uh, couples who are uh, there in couple protection homes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we are able to fix the accountability of state and uh, at the same time saving the lives of these uh, couples who got married according to their choice. Mm. So in a way, the, the, you know, the whole program has been su successful in one way, but there are still uh, obstacles to be faced at the local law and order situation, the policing situation. Uh, we yes. still have uh, some way to go. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, particularly in the given context, when uh, there is this government, uh, BJP government in power, uh, they are totally against these uh, uh, safe houses. And uh, they are actually against the idea of choice marriage because they believe in one vavastha and that all. So they are uh, uh, every day cutting on the budget uh, aspect of it. And uh, they are snatching away the facility. Earlier, there was a, pro uh, there was a plan of establishing these uh, uh, protection homes uh, in, uh, 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 in uh, better locations. But mm -hmm. now uh, we see that uh, these are being run uh, in more congested uh, places and uh, there is only one room and there are six couples uh, after getting uh, married, mm -hmm. they are living there in the same room. Uh, so uh, after, uh, in, uh, during this regime particularly, uh, these uh, couple protection homes uh, are facing uh, a type of hostility uh, from the government side. But mm. uh, yes, uh, 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 due to the uh, pressure of our organizations, they are not uh, able to close these, uh, to decide on that part. Uh, yeah. But yes, uh, every day uh, the problems are on increase due to the negative uh, attitude of this uh, government. Mm. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I'll come back to you. Uh, I would also like to now bring in uh, Mr. Vincent. Um, um, Mr. Vincent has witnessed a lot of crime against couples uh, because of their caste identities. Um, Mr. Vincent, why do you think that couples who choose love face so much opposition in our societies? And what is the situation in South India? Is it any better than the North? At least that is a perception to us in the North that maybe things are better in the South. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Greetings to uh, everyone. I am Kadir Alice Vincent. 
from Madurai is uh, South India, Tamil Nadu, actually. Um, thank you, Akita. See, I think it's a three, uh, three basic reasons for the violence against couples based on the caste identities. Of course, caste. Uh, then there are issues of patriarchy and uh, class too. But the reason for crime are not confined to these three aspects. It could be birth, the work they do, today the kind of violence against the LBGT uh, communities also in the rise. Importantly, the perpetrators of violence see the women's body as an institution of caste purity. This, there is this myth their caste is prote protected if they get their daughter married in their caste. So first they see the women as unit that produce and uh, perpetuate is caste. Second is their inherent belief that women are inferior to them, that women are inferior to men. They see women as institution that protect caste, that produces caste and uh, as property. This kind of violence exists because they consider any violation of the decade by women as a humiliation meted out to their caste and their family. This concept of arranged marriage, which they claim is marriage arranged by the family, is actually a caste marriage. Arranged marriage is a, a patriarchal arrangement. It does not involve the consent of the couple. Is it the decision taken by the caste by the family? When it is come to family, there are factors like caste obedience to on the part of the couple, etc. To claim that arranged marriage Uh, or done by family is deceiving, it is being done the protect caste and the pulled patriarchy. This violence exists because of these issues. So they also say that the caste is a hurdle to love. It is also a myth. This is a universal claim in the part of this world. The truth is love is a hurdle to caste. As South India and uh, North, South also, South India also has a history of honor killing as North uh, India does. Just that is not uh, exposed, it was uh, in the North because it has happened within families. There are not just honor killing, but honor suicide too, and they are hidden from the public eyes. The virgin goddess of our land are actually women who were killed for honor. In Tamil Nadu, there are, there are two, four honor killing every month. Suicide are also happening in comparison. It is the same to South and uh, North. The, I, I would like to share one uh, incident in, uh, in Tamil Nadu incidents. Very, I, I, am, I am interested in fact finding that with the I still makes me uh, nervous to talk about it. This happened in 2005 in a village near Nerakote in Tamil Nadu, actually. The girl belonged to Niger community and the boy was a Dalit. They eloped, but the people from the girl village managed to track them down. They brought her back to the village and tied her up with a chain in a public place like a dog. They collected money to purify the temple that had been made impure by the Gale Association with the Dalit. They used the money to whitewash all the 70 houses in the locality. For three days, the Gale was kept alive. She was treated like a dog and given food in the dog bowl. On the third day, she was killed by poisoning. I reached the village. The every next day, very next day, but all I could see were her bones. The village looked like it had just celebrated a festival. Whitewashed houses and a temple with a new look. I think the same north 
and uh, uh, South, uh, so maybe both incident. I am, I mean, last is 17 years, I handled the fact finding only. I am individual fact finding and involved in, uh, in 260 honor killing cases in directly intervened. Last 25 in Tamil Nadu, only five cases only in convention. Otherwise, all cases in Aikito are closed in our uh, judicial system. It's, you know, when we hear these stories, it, uh, it just makes you think about how powerful hate is and how weak, uh, you know, love is in the face of this kind of social systemic hate. Uh, and like you said, it's somewhere it's all based on this construct of caste, which um, it's, it's not even human. It, uh, it comes from some, some other aspect of uh, People's I, minds. It's yeah. Me, it's a me. I, I, I'm criticized to in the, the middle class uh, mindset. Mm. It's just below ten percent of the population who tells the honor killing should be strictly opposed it and abolished in this society. And the mm. other side, in the again below ten percent of the population who tell that the honor killing should be committed. Remaining eighty percent of the population tells the honor killing should be not be committed. And also the emotion of parents should be considered. I see this situation is most dangerous. It is a, a, our importance. So this is a, uh, the, most of the people, 80% of the job, people, this kind yeah. of mindset. Yeah, they are, on, they are on the line. Like they're, they're complicit with their silence, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. I'll come back to you. Uh, I would like to now come to Rubab, if Rubab is available. Uh, she had, uh, at the last uh, Twitter space, Rubab, you had talked about uh, the celebration of love in the history of Pakistan. And you had mentioned the name of villages like Radha Krishnan village and other love stories, which are part of the folk tales of Pakistan. Now, the common belief is that historically, marriage was always a tool for consolidating property and you know the concept of love marriage has come up in the last century or so with gender equality and the rise of women's empowerment. Uh, what are your this and can you tell us about the religious aspect of love in Pakistan and the opposition to interfaith marriages? Okay, so as um, as somebody said and as I was saying earlier, love is about, about equality, and essentially, uh, very quickly, um, and and as somebody also mentioned, patriarchy. Interestingly, from the religious aspect also, I mean, some like to believe that this even concept of love marriage is recent, but that is not true. Because uh, from the religious perspective, if you look at it, it was Khadija, the wife of the prophet, who was much older than him also, who sent him a proposal for marriage. And uh, so here's a woman proposing a man. And now today we have given them chai trays to be selected by men. So how is that equality? And how much uh, uh, does a woman have a say in her marriage and her uh, to choose her life partner? Um, and uh, which again, you know, places an emphasis on equality. And, you know, very, very quickly, um, somehow the important topic, I'd like to thank you and Bina Server and everybody, because apart from the universal um, language of love and, how it's bringing, you know, so many, it's even today, it's brought together a tapestry um, uh, and a mosaic of beautiful, diverse people around. Uh, see, it um, uh, when, you know, today, if you look at South Asia, it's pretty much like the old Venetian culture where marriage is divorced from love. Okay. And it's based on land and financial interests. So that was not the case earlier. And what that does is, and even when, uh, uh, and if you look at it, why has it become such a big, big issue celebrating Valentine? At the end of the day, every um, love is about peace um, and we should be promoting a dialogue between civilizations rather than a clash between civilizations. But why is it scorned upon? Why is it not normalized? Why? Because it challenges, it challenges inequality. Uh, it, if a woman is empowered enough to have a say, or if a man uh, is empowered enough uh, to have a say in who they marry, 
And um, all of these, uh, if I'm honest, these folk love stories also that I've shared, and I hope that you'll be kind enough to share. Yeah, we'll they share. were also rebels. So they, instead of following the sheep mentality, the herd mentality, um, they uh, chose to stand up and they cho chose to speak uh, up and they uh, cho chose to be with who they wanted to be. So I was saying that if you, if you, um, that they were, these folk heroes, they were rebels. So if you have to be a rebel, you, uh, you've got to be a rebel in love rather than a rebel in hate. Mm, At the end of the day, um, uh, this Twitter hashtag was started uh, to challenge um, extremism. And we, uh, we decided to reclaim the vibrance, the colors and the diversity of our country through love mm. and to celebrate uh, our shared civilization and the beautiful, uh, and all of these villages, you see, they have a rich history. Some are 800 years old, some are 900 years old. And if you look at their names, there's a village called Prem Nagar that is like the village of love. So it's about reclaiming uh, the beauty that we have um, and the beauty that we have in our origins. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, you know, these beautiful folk traditions. We'll, uh, we'll try and play your presentation as well later. Uh, and let's come to the other side of the border now. Let's come to Ms. Jagmati, uh, you know, coming to talking about villages in Pakistan called Prem Nagar. Uh, we have, um, you know, in India, we have the problem of hub panchayats, uh, you know, they're actively encouraging honor-based crime. And many of these are because of inter-community love. So uh, can you share your experience about why do these rural communities feel so threatened by love and why do they react so violently, even against their own family members? I mean, forget girls, even boys are not allowed to choose for themselves. So can you share your experience about working with these communities and in villages? Uh, uh, while analyzing the uh, different cases, uh, we, uh, uh, what we found that uh, the most heinous uh, barbaric violence is uh, in those cases where the girls are from upper caste and the boys are from Dalit caste. And uh, if a girl is from uh, 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 Pigeantry Dart community and a boy is from uh, Balmiki, then uh, surely they are going to be killed. Uh, and uh, 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 yes, uh, with the changing of time, that the tolerance for uh, choice marriage has increased. But uh, uh, that also, uh, uh, with uh, 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 in those castes where uh, this uh, 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 shifting of property is does not take place. Uh, uh, what we feel that uh, uh, there are seeds of uh, equality in choice marriage, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which make these people uh, upset. Because if a, a girl from upper caste, she uh, decides to get married to a Dalit boy, then uh, uh, definitely uh, the girl has got hostile today on the issue of marriage. To, tomorrow she will claim her property also. And when their kids will be there, they, uh, it does not mean that uh, they will follow any caste system. Uh, and uh, they can also uh, uh, go for... Uh, uh, living according to their choice. So the uh, uh, seed of formation of an egalitarian society is there in uh, choice marriage. And uh, uh, while uh, these girls are getting married to Dalit boys, uh, and uh, if they claim their property, then with the change of property, the uh, shift of power takes place uh, in a way. Uh, and this shift of power uh, is uh, disliked the most by those sections, those hegemonic sections who have been uh, controlling the uh, socio-economic life out there in rural areas, in villages, uh, and uh, uh, and all. So, uh, in those cases, these uh, khap panchayats they are so very well organized that uh, uh, the different political parties, those who are in power, mainstream political parties, they don't want to annoy the caste uh, panchayats uh, due to the uh, vote consideration. Vote. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, and uh, they uh, don't uh, allow the law to be implemented. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the response of human rights uh, commission or women commission when we approach them we have been we have been approaching them many times because we have intervened uh, in, in many cases uh, their response is very uh, delayed uh, but uh, at the same time the uh, political parties uh, uh, and uh, uh, the caste panchayats they are hand in gloves on this issue they have mm. some tacit uh, understanding uh, within uh, and uh, the the bureaucracy and the police uh, uh, bureaucracy they come from this hegemonic section itself uh, they also uh, deliberately uh, don't uh, want to let these marriages become a uh, 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 normalized uh, normal thing uh, in the society because mm. they have their own vested interest the power mm. consideration the vote uh, consideration these all play their role uh, mm. and uh, uh, with uh, recent uh, now uh, we are um, uh, uh, leading our campaign for the enactment of law against honor crime and honor killing uh, mm -hmm. and the upa government earlier upa government they had formed a group of ministers also to take up this issue but mm -hmm. uh, when this uh, uh, bjp came in power uh, and we uh, met the law minister, the then law minister, Mr. Sadanand Gowda. There was a delegation of women organizations. And uh, when we went to him, uh, uh, his response was that, uh, oh, you are here for the enactment of law against honor crime and honor killing. You uh, give me your memorandum and uh, we will think it over. And I have a uh, huge fear that uh, this, if we go for enactment of this law, it will be hugely misused, like the 498A anti dowdy and the SCST Act. And uh, uh, after that, we never got any response from uh, uh, this uh, present regime. So, uh, there, uh, the political uh, economy linked to this. Uh, this issue uh, it plays very big role uh, in the in the violence and uh, we need to expose it more and more uh, okay. it is uh, 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 whether there are minorities where are uh, whether there are uh, these lower castes uh, the uh, the forces the hegemonic forces which are uh, holding uh, all type of resources and enjoying all type of uh, freedom they don't want these people to come up and mm -hmm. break the barriers lying over there so uh, this is the crux of our uh, uh, experience that uh, uh, this uh, political economy linked to this uh, plays a very big role uh, uh, that uh, 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 the state agencies uh, uh, they they don't come forward to protect this democratic right of uh, individuals to get married according to their choice. Right, that's right. And in fact, talking about caste, I'll come to Mr. Vincent now because, um, uh, you know, he told me this uh, case study about uh, a, a Dalit Christian boy who married a girl from uh, some, some other caste and he he had uh, he he had good finances. He was good looking. He was a good catch for any girl. Uh, but because of the caste problem, and though he was a he was a Christian, he was not even technically uh, you know uh, uh, like coming in the, uh, coming in the way of uh, the the Hindu caste hierarchy. Uh, even then, the girl's family had had a problem with it. So I'm wondering if it is a property issue because he had probably more property than her. But it was a caste issue there. So, uh, so, so, Mr. Vincent, I mean, talking about caste discrimination, you've been working on it since the 1990s. Do you think things are getting better because of modernization and technology? Uh, is the internet helping to bring people together? Or are things uh, getting worse for couples of love? And yeah, you can also elaborate on this story that you had shared with me. Uh... The word is getting modern day, uh, modern day by day. Cost and day is many dimension are equally growing. The question is what the real modernization? People think they say wearing a clothes from a good brand, eating good food, civilized behavior are uh, common over language is, but thinking 
is not a modern thinking is a regressive it's casteist and uh, patriarchal there are uh, no human thinking the people don't have enough thinking about equality dignity perspective and values that is how i see things that's how we could measure the modernization is not about external changes it's also and more importantly about internal changes this modernization does not promote equality and fight discrimination so whatever it is when there is discussion on marriage caste plays on important role see you know in, uh, in the marriage uh, in the advertisement in uh, media and newspaper caste is no bar but uh, exclusive only dalits you see <laughs> see within uh, the uh, uh, backward communities easily marriage this is main question however civilized modern there are secondly we have to look at the backward caste where scheduled caste or forward caste where versus scheduled caste marriage is it happen with within caste that come under backward classes should not taken as a measures we have to consider these two and you know one i would like to share about one uh, incident this is a uh, the boy are very well rich actually uh, he completed a in uh, doing uh, in engineering uh, in 2009 this incident that took up the ca- case of sri priya and patrakali sri priya was from the uh, color communities obc community while patrakali was a dalit both of them were injury who got married against the wishes of their families and began living together things were going well till stepriya father met her on the particular day he carried sweets flowers and fruits for his daughter and told her that he was been terrible hurt by her decision he tried to convince her to go back home with him when stepriya refused to, to go three men who were with the father hacked her to death when i visited stepriya home to next day the fruits and the sweets were still there her father got arrested and jailed i personally met him and asked in you are caste important than your daughter he replied that it is important that them god actually uh, there another one incident in dalit boy is a daniel he is a, uh, uh, in tanish back he got every month salary in that time in 2 lakh salary but compare with the in obc gel is a uh, compare with economic wise the, the, the gel is are in poor after marriage in uh, killed by uh, the, the gel are killed by one family members the mm-hmm. last message in uh, uh, the gel are to gaspen is is very painful uh, message mm. so so modernization is very because in everybody you know you know and some people are asking questions hey, kadir you are uh, looks or uh, compare with the dalits the people the minds the dalits are is very black and uh, uh, is some some people ask the questions our organization it uh, have uh, dalit organization people raise the questions or organization like in uh, corporate uh, uh, setup this mindset the dalit organizations very poor and in where in old uh, ambedkar photos and uh, uh, in is uh, the destroyed in uh, uh, chair and uh, uh, table so is uh, people are okay this is a dalit organization maybe this mindset is very very uh mm. i am a lot very of persistent yeah. yeah even now in caste discrimination in in, in uh, now is us also yeah it is aware yeah so broad india indian everywhere in living the caste system is functioning yes <laughs> unfortunately yeah, anyway you you caste sex in the, is any uh, country in caste is, uh, system is functioning that place indian are living yes correct correct yeah thank you for sharing that and this brings the uh, asif has raised an important point uh, in the chat and i will bring this up with asif uh, so uh, mr asif one of the groups that actually you have been supporting 
at Dhanak of Humanity are LGBTQ couples. So uh, can you tell us about the challenges that they face and how you have been helping them stay safe from their own families sometimes? Yeah, uh, so uh, before answering that, I would just uh, quickly add to the great work of uh, Kathir and Jagmati ji that uh, the Supreme Court of India has given a direction in the case of Shakti Vaini versus Union of India. And it is very clear that every state should have special cell for couples and safe houses for couples. Mm -hmm. And in Delhi, there is one safe house for couple, which we have managed to open and we are trying to open in every state. So we are working together and hopefully we will be able to do that. Okay, so coming back to the question of LGBTQ and all, mm -hmm. and of course we are, uh, we, we, we can't limit love only to cis couples. We have to go to the trans and LGBTQ okay. couples also because that is being raised all over. And in the Supreme Court now, the Supreme Court have asked all the petitions to compile and come to them. They are kept for the hearing for because uh, the, uh, the same-sex couples, they are asking for marriage right under the Special Marriage Act. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, as far as LGBTQ couples are concerned, we are not directly working with them, but we do get cases of trans couples. So mm -hmm. where, where mm -hmm. the tra one is trans man and one is a cis uh, partner. So, uh, and Dhanak is the only organization and Delhi is the only place where one trans couple has got the safe house, government safe house to stay. So mm -hmm. this is a good, good, uh, a good thing to start with mm -hmm. and it should be replicated everywhere. Uh, so yes, we handle such cases. And how challenging it is? Yes, it is very challenging because in cis couples, uh, at least the marriage is recognized. You know, it is mm -hmm. there is an option of marriage where male and female, if you if you quote it in that sense. But then uh, in in trans, yes, they have to go through a lot. They have to change. They have to do the sex change, and the marriage is not recognized. So there are a lot of challenges. It's same is the case with the same sex marriage. So this is yet to be recognized as per the law and society, of course, they don't recognize it because in cis couples, at least the marriage is, you know, somewhere recognized, as I told earlier. Mm -hmm. For them, it is very, very challenging. And we keep getting uh, such calls for trans couples from trans couples. We help them because for trans in India, there is, uh, although uh, trans, uh, an individual, is an is recognized by Indian law. Uh, mm -hmm. There are garima gre. There are you know shelter homes for trans individuals who mm -hmm. are trans men or trans women. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no home, no safe house for couple. So therefore, therefore, this safe house is also applicable for those who are in the same sex as well as in the trans relationship. Okay, so these are. These safe homes seem to be like the only sanctuary right now that uh, <laughs> couples uh, can uh, hope for. Uh, well, that's a big, that's, you know, it, it's, you know, as Jagmati ji has already highlighted, mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, because of uh, women and children are the last priority of the government. So budgets mm -hmm. and everything has been cut down and it's, so yes, but it's a respite for such couples who have left their homes, who are fearing threat to life and limb, and they need some time to, you know, re-establish, resettle. Mm -hmm. That also includes the period of marriage because marriage is not an instant thing for interfaith couples or such couples. Yes, mm -hmm. for intercaste couples, there is an option. They can go for a religious marriage. But for interfaith couples, immediately it will be termed as love jihad. And for trans couples, you know, or, or uh, you know, same-sex couples, this, that option is also missing. So that's these safe houses are really, really helpful. And uh, in Delhi, it is working. Somehow it is working, uh, but not that effective way, but it's somewhere we have started with. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that can be replicated, that can be done in other states. And also I can read the chats going on that why there are no safe houses in, in our country and all. I think we can synergize, we can work together and bring some policy changes uh, and make some noise on that. Great. And if Sapan can be a part of that, that would be, we would love to lend our voice and, and support you in that uh, endeavor. Uh, let's take a, a larger macro picture and come to Mr. Melinda. 
since you are you have been watching the politics of all the countries in south asia uh, what would you say is the role of love in politics and do you think that this opposition to love that's typical in our south asian societies does it translate to a kind of opposition to love and peace at a larger level of governance and politics so actually what i'm trying to say is do you think we would have more peace and harmony in society at a macro level if we made space for all kinds of love at a micro level in society and also because you're a poet uh, i know you'll be able to uh, to see what i mean when i say that yeah that, uh, <laughs> that's a that's a leap of faith uh, almost uh, you know to uh, see whether in the first, in the first place uh, is there opposition to love i don't think that is the case uh, all people love and are loved but uh, in aggregate and when you politicize it it becomes like that because this uh, political economy was brought up just give me one minute to mention this in the 19th century uh, mm. sri lanka is a matriarchal singhala buddhist society is matriarchal the woman would have many many you know lovers and uh, she could kick out the man at any point so property was passed down through the uh, the, the female line and mm. even today when you have formal marriage ceremonies it's the uncle that gives away the bride because you know the uncle is the uncle you don't know who the father is so the british brought in where they wanted to get a grip on on uh, property transfers uh, and uh, they they made the marriage legal uh, you know uh, compulsory and of course there was a, there was a you know massive divorce rate because people were doing what they were doing and then they brought in a law to say for five years you can't get a divorce and that is how men for the first time in so many thousands of years had control over women and property and they didn't give up on that so just just to mention that you know that mm. that part of the story is also there all my life i have been uh, interested in two things it's love and social justice now i think social justice is a part of love to come back to your uh, question you as we love that uh, that we can think about social justice uh, whether whether that will transform into uh, into uh, you know better politics uh, better society i you know, i'm not a i'm not a prophet or a, or a crystal gazer but uh, pablo neruda said this once he said you can't placate uh, the anger of the world with a drop of love or poetry for that you need resolute hearts so my take on that is if you have drops and dro- lots and lots of drops of poetry and love hearts become can be transformed into some kind of resoluteness which in turn can can have an impact on uh, on how we do politics how we think about politics how we think about each other how we think about communities and intercommunal this that and the other it's not just about marriage and 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 love and things like that that is that is one part of the story but i think that is mostly an expression of some underlying foundational uh, mistrust distrust or fear uh, or hatred based mm-hmm. on difference so we 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 need to get to those things as well not not to kind of downplay love and things like that but uh, uh, where is the, where did the caste system come from where does uh, you know these religious uh, fixations come from why are we so uh, insecure about who we are that we cannot tolerate uh, a diff- difference or uh, and things like that so laws probably help uh, to a certain extent but you can have the best laws but if they are not implemented if they don't have the teeth then it won't happen uh, at at one level you want communities to be strong vis-a-vis mm-hmm. the state Uh, on the other hand uh, when communities that uh, have such strong fixations about what is proper and what is improper what will be tolerated and what will be not well, what will not be tolerated then you wonder you know what is better the state or the community so there is a there's probably a, a dialectic there that we need to kind of uh, get a get a uh get our hearts and minds around and try mm-hmm. to figure out how to move ahead but i i i don't think that love the beautiful thing and, and we are talking only about romantic love here you know when i'm talking yes. about other love whether yes. that alone is sufficiently all love a good uh, love story and i'm sure even those who uh, are adamant about uh, you know uh, identity and love 
yes. would not cry when they hear about some uh, yeah. cross cultural interfaith love that's happening to some other people yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. But when it comes to a personal thing, it, it can be different. Yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, even those who oppose love will still go watch a Bollywood love story, you know, and uh, they would still enjoy it. And I think what you said about Sri Lanka's uh, matriarchal uh, property laws, you know, actually, um, you know, taking away uh, women's rights after the British came and they, and, you know, started their own system of marriage, uh, marriage laws. I think that happened in some communities in South India as well, uh, where uh, women had to actually give up uh, their property rights started going down after those laws were implemented and they were more powerful before. Yeah, but it was, it was not only yeah. about laws, because now, for mm -hmm. some people, mm -hmm. uh, say Singhala, in certain certain sections, mostly urban though, uh, what they take to be Singhala Buddhist culture mm. in uh, in relation to love, romance, marriage, and things is actually Victorian stuff. Mm. <laughs> Buddhists were never really uh, they didn't mm. care about, about the most celebrated love stories in uh, in our in the last 150 years, all from ancient times, are about people who kind of transcended these things, who went yeah. against. Uh, uh, you know, conventions about, you know, the king should not marry a common that kind of thing. So those, the, the poetry, the novels, the films, everything that has, uh, th that have got traction are those that celebrate that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, where people think, well, what the hell is this? I mean, it's all nonsense, you know, it's love is love, like that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing that. And talking of stories, um, our, we had one more speaker, Dr. Simon Zakaria, who was awarded the Bangla Academy Literary Award in 2020 for his contribution to Bangladeshi folklore. And unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. But I'm happy to now welcome Kushi Kabir from Dhaka into the discussion. Uh, Kushi is, as you all know, well-known human rights activist and environmentalist. And she's one of the advisors at SAPAN. Um, so uh, tell us, Kushi, isn't it interesting that folk tales from one region of South Asia make it to all the other regions and they become part of our shared cultural heritage. Yeah, it's very interesting that <coughs> the folk tales celebrate love. Yeah. Very often it's not the happily, uh, living happily ever after kind of thing. It ends in death because uh, somehow lovers are separated and then Stories are given almost like the Romeo Juliet kind of stories that are parallels of thinking the other one has died and then the partner then commits suicide too. Mm -hmm. So those are celebrated throughout, and you know there are many different angles and different stories that come in. But what's interesting that even like in the Bengali folklore, and if you look at the oldest poet we have in. Uh, Bengali uh, poet alone, and he in the 15th century would write about uh, love stories, not just from the region itself, but across the region too. So, you know, you had your own love stories and really it, it used to be in plays, it used to be in different forms. So you really, uh, you celebrate the love, mm. uh, whether it ends in a tragedy or not. But on the other hand, in your life, in your lifetime, uh, culture, the society frowns on love. Mm -hmm. The moment they find that their child has chosen somebody and wants to marry that person, immediately forced into marriage with somebody else. Uh, that continues There's a dichotomy of what the reality is. Mm -hmm. And of course, class, caste, uh, religion, everything else comes into play. That anything that's different and outside of the, what is considered the accepted norm is not, is frowned upon. And there are many, uh, and there are many, uh, you know, uh, ways of trying to ensure that this uh, relationship does not last and this relationship does not go on. I was interested to hear about the safe home for LGBTQI and I just wrote a little question asking if, uh, if this is permanent, if it's, if it's a stopgap 
uh, solution or not. One has to think of much longer term. I mean, all these safe homes are all for a short while. There is, I think it's good that we're having this, this discussion and we are challenging that uh, there needs to be changes. And I think we need to start challenging and changing what norms are and not just uh, thinking of short term and just legal changes because legal changes by itself don't work. It's just that how do we get the society to change? So what I did was I asked a friend of mine because literally at the last minute, just last night, who I thought if she shared her, her sister's story with us, would say that how it is uh, uh, possible that uh, if you have the uh, you know spirit, if you know what you want, and if you're if you I guess it's also to do with I wouldn't say always with class. Very often the class is if you're very poor or if you're from a uh, it's very exploited or very uh, uh, discriminated background, then uh, the then you know the pressures on you is much stronger because the entire the rest of the society will pounce on you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have seen that if there is agency, if there is organized uh, support systems, mm -hmm. one can overcome yes. that. So yes, I yes. do think as with everywhere else, that organization and strength is really important. Uh, I have with me here, Natasha Ahmed. Natasha Ahmed is a very good friend of mine. She's a Bangladeshi and she'll tell her story, but she lives in Kolkata. And I think I'd like her to talk about, you know, in Bangladesh, she was the first one who fought a case to, and to be able to get her son and her spouse a uh, no visa required stamp on their passport. Yet Natasha, I think, still needs to get a visa to remain in Kolkata, in India, to be, stay with her family, with her husband and her uh, son. So this is something I think it's one should hear about. Yeah, these are some of the practical aspects of uh, very practical aspects uh, of love that we should all hear. And since we are celebrating love, yeah, we should also so I think uh, hear these successful love stories. Successful love stories, but what is interesting is the mindset. Again, as I said, her mm -hmm. sister had an inter uh, uh, inter whatever culture into language, into culture, uh, marriage. And he's prominent too, she's prominent. But Bina Sarwar was looking up his name in, the, in Wikipedia and it's totally falsified and he's made into a Bengali when he's not. <laughs> and he's been given different names and his home district is given something that is totally wrong because he's, I think Natasha from Punjab, maybe Natasha can. Uh, yeah. about I think it. Natasha can share that very interesting cross-border interfaith family story. Yeah, yeah Natasha, please go ahead. Yeah. So go ahead, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I was hearing about all these uh, love stories and the struggles women, uh, women and men both face. Um, in the, in their in their personal life, which should be their personal life and personal space. Uh, so I'm Natasha. I've been working in Bangladesh. I, I am a Bangladeshi living here in India uh, on a visa, a spouse visa, though there is no category, but then the embassy in Bangladesh wants to call it a spouse visa. Uh, it's actually a ex visa or whatever. Mm, uh, and uh, we are married for last 23 years now. And still, uh, I have to go every year to get a new visa. And there are times I'm asked questions like, uh, this marriage certificate is nine years old. So how do I know that you are still married? So this kind of questions and situations I also face. Uh, uh, and uh, then on the other hand, when my husband being an Indian, also was facing a lot of problem getting a visa, regular visa to visit the in-laws over there. 
I uh, had to fight a case for him and my son to get an NBR because the law that we have, the nationality law in Bangladesh that we have, they don't, uh, they ha they don't have any problem when a man is married to a foreign spouse and they, uh, they get a no visa required stamp in their passport or a nationality, but a woman can't do that. So Barista Sarah Hussain was uh, uh, very helpful in this way and she fought the case for me. And finally we got uh, that uh, my husband can get an NBR and thus the uh, women who, are, who have foreign spouse and children, they are now getting NBRs. So that's one side of the money that was sort of handled but when i come to my visa thing my status in india that's a problem area because uh, india has a law where every spouse from any other country except pakistan and bangladesh they can get a oci or a resident permit but us people from pakistan or bangladesh can't get it because in 47, the people wanted to break away from India. So that's our fault. Though I keep on saying that we are Bangladeshis, we didn't decide anything. We happened, Bangladesh happened in 71. So what is our problem? Why can't we get our thing? But um, uh, I, I've been asking, I've been talking to lawyers here. And I hope I'll be able to challenge that. I need to challenge that also, that why can't uh, we Bangladeshis get a, a OCI? Though the interesting thing is that my mother is from here in India. My grandparents were from here and they in 47 with my father uh, opted for Pakistan, East Pakistan, Pakistan that time. Um, uh, but even then, we are we have the legacy here but then we won't be able to claim anything because we are we no, and ironically it is exactly these three countries which were one country at one time but it's like we're constantly punishing each other with the, with the visa issues totally so bangladeshis i would say have a better uh, status than the Pakistanis. Oh my God, Pakistanis will never get a long-term visa. They'll have to. And and each time I go for visa, I'll be asked why I'm not changing my nationality. And I have to tell them because I don't want to change my nationality. But then you should. I'm, I don't see any reason why I should. I should be able to stay here with my own nationality. So that's a constant battle. But, uh, but the And your sister also has that cross-border story. No, they don't. Because no, they don't. Mm -hmm. No, because uh, my brother-in-law, though he's a Punjabi, uh, mm -hmm. born in Amritsar, they moved to East Pakistan before the before seventy-one. So, okay. and then they uh, they were staying here. So they don't have that. And because he's a Muslim mm -hmm. and uh, from uh, Bangladesh, so they don't have that kind of a problem. The mm. problem starts when I have someone from the other religion, especially Muslim marrying a Hindu mm. or Muslim, because, because I, uh, I've seen Muslim, uh, Muslims marrying Christians. That's not, that's okay. That's fine. Like, especially if you are studying in US or England and you have your uh, boyfriend and then you're getting married, it's fine. People people are okay but then when it comes to a person from india and a hindu then the pro problem starts uh, but I, I would say i'm lucky i didn't have any kind of such problem because uh, my family and the society that i live in or with the people I, I, who are my friends and family they don't have an issue of uh, with this and uh, but then there are people who find it very difficult. And uh, like uh, we got married uh, under Special Marriage Act of 1872. Asif Mahyuddin was talking about that. Mm. We follow the same thing here in Bangladesh. Mm. But uh, because the family court is 
religion uh, driven and uh, weak uh, so we don't have the special marriage act don't have any inheritance law mm. so when you are married under that the people it's their duty to tell us inform us that i we need to get married into some religious thing because uh, because of the inheritance and uh, so that's another problematic mm. area because if i have property in my country i cannot get um, uh, have my children have it um, mm. because i uh, we are uh, doing this intermarriage uh, marriage and uh, interreligious marriage and all sorts of things mm. so these are the very practical problems that i have mm. and uh, it's something uh, we are fighting and i think it's uh, it's actually uh, when it comes to women choosing their partner that's a main concern for many because the family is losing control over the woman that's a mm. huge thing and also parting away with the little bit of property she owns to another mm. person who is not from the community is also a problem yeah. so yeah, yeah. So thank I, you for sharing the cross cross border perspective i mean we've been hearing about problems that each country has been facing uh, you know within its own boundaries so the visa issue uh, comes up and i think here sapan has been uh, we have a campaign called milne do in which we this is exactly one of the issues that we are trying to raise that it should be easier to get visas to each other's countries yeah. and it shouldn't be like a torture mm. uh, just because you fell in love with <laughs> across the border so thank you natasha for sharing uh, your point of view and uh, i'd like to come back now to uh, bina bina would you like to uh, take over now and uh, you know take the conversation forward um hi ekta and uh, thank you everyone uh, what a brilliant uh, conversation so many Uh, really uh, deep points and i am so so delighted that my dear friend from uh, of many decades uh, kavita ramdas uh, agreed at the very at very short notice to join us take out time from her busy schedule on a sunday morning in uh, new york where she's based kavita is uh, the most one of the most dynamic uh, and powerful women that you will ever meet and um, uh, her mother her parents uh, lalita and Ra- uh, ramu ramdas uh, 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 I, i take the liberty of calling them lolly and ramu uh, Ram- uh, and th- this is not kavita's shanakh this is not her identity but i'm just saying this that you know you're not here because of your parents kavita but because i, I do want to uh, take a I'm very much here honor. because of my parents i wouldn't exist without this them. is true this is true you are here because of parents that is true that is true that is very true but just to say that you are not invited to speak here because of your parents and 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 who are both part of our uh, founding members for sapan for south asia peace action network um, and i take like i said i take them take the liberty to call them lolly and ramu because i met them uh, at the anti nuclear demonstrations in japan many years ago after our countries um uh, did the nuclear tests and um uh, kavita i'm not going to go into your any there's just two your the, she i asked her for a brief bio she sent me six pages so it's like two <laughs> incredibly long when you <laughs> long bio and she does incredible work with uh, philanthropy with women's rights uh, she is a graduate of mount holyoke college where my sister went and where my dear friend seema went who also uh, is a cl- close friend so, so kavita i'm without any further ado i'm going to ask you to um present your closing remarks for this section and also because you know just coincidentally i think we would have asked you to speak anyway but it just so happens that you have this cross border cross border cross religious marriage yourself and i just want to say that you know that there's that the precedent there from very long ago we had uh, the founder of pakistan married a parsi ratti jana ratti patit but anyway um uh, kavita over to you and we look forward to your uh, closing remarks for this really uh, uh, fantastic discussion it's gone on for a little bit longer than we would have uh, wanted but um we'll just you know just straight over to you kavita thank you salam namaste everybody and thank you so much i feel like i learned so much in this very rich conversation ekta you did a amazing job trying to manage this and um just the level of i think 
you know, sometimes you can feel very overwhelmed by all the disheartening news. But I think what was wonderful for me about this conversation was hearing from people like Jagmati Ji, like Iqbal Bhai, like Melinda in, in uh, Sri Lanka, like um, Natasha and, and others from, and Kushi Ji from um, Bangladesh, that, you know, even though there are these huge obstacles, um, both from state and society, Melinda, thank you so much for clarifying that. I thought that was such a, that was such an important thing for us to understand that sometimes we as individuals and as the communities that we are part of can create the biggest challenges. And our colleague from Nepal, um, Sharma, um, uh, uh, Sharma Ji, she, uh, she, yeah, she also shared with us that, you know, community is a mixed is a mixed thing, right? We need communities. We don't exist just as individuals, but communities are often the places that put the greatest pressures on individuals to adapt and conform to community values. So then the state can sometimes be a place, which is why the Special Marriage Act is used in so many instances by couples when their communities are not actually willing to stand by them. And in fact, their communities are actually harmful to them. So what I very much enjoyed about this con conversation was um, an understanding of the multiple ways in which our realities are complicated, but also by the recognition that so many people are doing things to try and make a difference. Vincent, your story was really heartbreaking, heartrending, but not the only one that I've heard in my many years as an activist for women's rights. I think throughout this whole discussion, the the strands that I saw included patriarchy very deeply um, in, interwoven with all of this, because even on the issue of LGBTQ activism, partly LGBTQ activism has also sought state protection because communities have been so harsh. And yet, in another way, you could argue that there has always been an interesting space carved out for third gender and non-gender conforming um, patterns within South Asia that was actually just quietly accepted by community. Community kind of adjusted, as we say in South Asia. So for all these reasons, this was a rich and valuable conversation. I learned a lot from it. I also want to go back now and look up the Special Marriage Act and understand how it came out of this uh, British law. So uh, much for us to learn there. And then lastly, just to say as an Indian, um, someone of Indian origin, who came to the U.S. with an Indian passport, married a Pakistani, Iqbal Ahmed's nephew, Zulfakar Ahmed. Um, and actually, the two of us had this wonderful opportunity to live together in Delhi, which is very rare for a Pakistani and an Indian to be able to have this opportunity for a brief moment under UPA laws. I, I think I would say that my, my sense of both what Sapan is trying to do as crazily impossible as it feels to live in a South Asia that would be visa free. Um, I think we have to have crazy impossible dreams because without them, we never get to change our reality. And I certainly hope that for my daughter who is now struggling as Natasha described to see if maybe she could apply for an o OCI card. My husband of course can never apply being Pakistani. Um, maybe our next generation will have some um, better opportunities because of the work that people like yourselves and so many others are doing. So, salam, namaste to us all. May we um, take, take these messages of love and poetry and possibility to heart. And a huge thanks to Bina and all of you in Sapan for keeping this kind of dream alive. I think it's very important to keep dreams alive. Shukriya. Thank you so much, Kavita, for those uh, very uh, succinct and uh, poignant remarks. Um, I wish we could have had uh, Zuli also online to say hello. I haven't seen him for many years. And uh, I think it's really hard that he cannot get a visa to go to India to visit your parents. It's really, really hard. I think we really need to. So the the petition that Ekta talked about is online at uh, www. Um, change.org slash milne do m-i-l-n-e-d-o um, which we need to spread I don't know we need to basically reach the policy makers somehow which we are somehow not managing to do because they really don't want to hear us I mean but but that doesn't mean we won't keep speaking we will keep speaking we will keep uh, bringing it out
ऊठ सुरख यकूत जेवे लाल चमकण थोड़ी सेब वाला सार विचो दंद चंबे दी कली की हंस मोती हो दाने निकले हुसैन अनार विचो उठ सुते से ज असाडड़ी तो सुसरी वांग क्यों पया है रे पढ़िया उठ के देव जवाब मैनू के अनिगड़ा बो गया है वे मैं ते नाल सहेलिया आड़ खड़ी मैनू पहर सारा गुजर गया है वे सुखी लदिया मेडड़ी से जो तो तू ते कौन कोई आन पिया है वे ऊठ सुरख यकूत जेवे लाल चमकण थोड़ी सेब वाला सार विचो दंद चंबे दी कली की हंस मोती